Welcome to a pathway of understanding through the gates of wisdom and peace. Abdul Rahim Green. Many people claim that what they have is from God. But the question is, can they prove it? If you are looking for certainty in an uncertain world, or maybe you're just curious, why do Muslims believe what they believe? To find out more, do not miss our fascinating and challenging series, The Proof That Islam Is The Truth. Join Abdul Rahim Green in The Proof That Islam Is The Truth, next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All praise is due to Allah. We praise Him, we seek His help, and we ask for His forgiveness. We take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. I'm Abdurrahim Green, and you're joining me for the proof that Islam is the truth. Now, today we're going to be talking about the preservation of the hadith and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam may God's peace and blessings be upon him and in the last episode we talked about the remarkable oral transmission and memorization of the Quran how children as young as seven years old even younger than that have memorized the entire Quran and by the way some of them don't even speak Arabic there's no book in the world like that. But the Quran is not the only source of guidance for Muslims. We also need the Sunnah and the living example of the Prophet Muhammad in order to fully comprehend and understand the religion of Islam. And we're going to examine today how the scholars of Islam have painstakingly preserved and authenticated the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. So that's our task today to talk about that. Just to remind ourselves about the ancient times when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions were living. As Michael Zwelter he notes that in ancient times when writing was scarcely used memory and oral transmission was exercised and strengthened to a degree now almost known. It was very common in those days for people to memorize and to transmit the sayings of their ancestors in an oral form, much more so than in a written form. And therefore, the ability to memorize accurately was much more strongly formed than it is today. Many people today don't really fully comprehend because we are not really used to that method of retaining information. And therefore in terms of memory and training our memory, it tends to be very weak. We prefer to record things on our hard disk, for example, or on bits of paper. But in those days, people tended to memorize things in their minds. Now, first of all, sometimes we find that people have not fully comprehended the importance of the sunnah of the Prophet. What is this sunnah of the Prophet? What do we mean by sunnah? Well, the word sunnah in Arabic means way. It's the prophetic way. 
the way that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, the things that he said, the things that he did, and the things that he approved of, all of this is called the sunnah. And the sunnah is preserved in what is called the hadith. Hadith means literally story. The Quran is also referred to as a hadith. In fact, it is the best hadith, the best story, the best narration. But generally in Islamic law, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad is recorded in the hadith. So the hadith is the term for those things or those writings in which the actions, the sayings, the approvals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, were recorded. Now there are numerous books of hadith because of course there are so many things that the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, said and so many things he did. We have to remember that the message, the messengership and the prophethood of Muhammad may God's peace and blessings be upon him, lasted a period of 23 years. So that's a lot of stuff. 23 years of what the Prophet did, what he said, what he approved of. So there are, of course, so many narrations, so many hadith of the Prophet Muhammad. And the whole issue of the hadith is compounded by the fact that many people after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, began to fabricate and began to invent lies about the Prophet. And they began to say that the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, said this, and the Prophet Muhammad said that. You can imagine, every person who sold rice, for example, realized that, well, you know, a good way to sell more rice is by saying, the Prophet said, eat rice, rice is good for you. So if everyone thinks that rice is good for you and that the Prophet said that, then more and more people are going to buy rice. So also rulers try to justify their actions, sometimes their wrong actions, by invented hadiths and sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. So what developed in the Muslim world, and we're going to talk about that, is a science, a very amazing science, through which and by which we could distinguish what are the true and what are the false sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. And all of this gives us added conviction that when we talk about the religion of Islam, we're talking about something verifiable. We're talking about something authentic. We're talking about something about which we have a scientific, verifiable process through which and by which we can know what the Prophet Muhammad said and what he didn't say. By the way, people were able to do this with the hadith or the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad in a way that they were never able to do with the Quran. First of all, the Quran was memorized in its entirety by thousands of Muslims from the earliest days of Islam. Also, in terms of its text, as we have already mentioned, it was compiled and collected and collated from the earliest days of Islam. So, if anyone wanted to make a different interpretation of Islam, if any deviant sect or group or ruler or individual wanted to justify something by the Qur'an, they were never able to invent a new verse or introduce a new ayah or verse of the Qur'an. It was impossible to do that because the text of the Qur'an had been established from the very earliest days of Muslim history and it was agreed upon unanimously by everybody. This was not the case with the hadith or the sayings of the Prophet. And we can say actually it is true until today. We still have numerous books of the hadith of the Prophet. 
And we do not have any single book where all of the authentic hadith of the Prophet have been compiled in one place. We do have a collection of hadith that is rigorously and highly authenticated, and it is considered to be the most authentic textual reference in the religion of Islam after the Quran, and that is known as Sahih al Bukhari. Sahih means good, sound, authentic. And Al-Bukhari is the name of the Imam or the scholar who collected these various traditions and sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. The next most authentic collection of prophetic traditions after Sahih al-Bukhari is Sahih muslim Again, that means the authentic and sound collection but this time, it was a collection that was compiled by Imam Muslim. He was also a very great scholar. The Quran says many times, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu atiyu Allah wa atiyu Rasul, which means, O oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that after the break. So don't go away, join us for the preservation of the sayings of the Prophet in our series, The Proof That Islam Is The Truth. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon all of you. Welcome back to The Proof That Islam Is The Truth. And today we're talking about the preservation of the hadith or the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. And we were talking about how important the sunnah and the example of the Prophet Muhammad is in understanding the religion of Islam. It's really essential to it. In fact, we find that many of the most important and essential basic acts of worship in Islam would not be fully defined just by reference to the Quran. For example, let's take the five daily prayers. If you wanted to know how to pray five times every day, what are the times of the prayers? How should we say the prayers? How many units are there for each particular prayer? What do we say in each position in the prayer? What are the positions? What are the orders of the positions in the prayer? These things are not mentioned in the Quran. The only way that we know about these things is through the preservation of the example of the Prophet Muhammad. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. So the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him said, pray as you have seen me pray. So Muslims therefore are trying to emulate and follow the example of the Prophet. The Quran says, Aqimu salah establish the ritual prayer, but the details of it, it is not given in the Quran. Similarly, there are many things in the Quran that we would not be able to understand it unless the life story, the life history of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, had been preserved. For example, the 80th surah of the Quran in the very first ayah, it says, Abbasa wa tawalla, which means he frowned and turned away. Who frowned? Who turned away from who? What is this talking about? Unless we know the seerah and the life history of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, we will be clueless about what this is actually referring to. And I'm only giving one of many, many examples in the Quran. In fact, the Quran itself stresses the importance of referring to the Prophet Muhammad May God's peace and blessings be upon him many, many times. Indeed, in one particular verse, Allah swears by himself. Nay, no, by Allah, they can have no faith. Their faith is not true, it's not real, unless they make you, Muhammad, a judge in all disputes between them and find no resistance in their hearts and submit with the fullest submission. 
In this verse, Allah is making it very clear that if a person is truly a believer in Allah and a believer in the last day, they will make the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, a judge in their disputes. And they will be happy with his decisions. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that whatever the Prophet gives you, you must take it. Whatever the Prophet orders you to leave, you must leave it. The Quran tells us that the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, did not speak from his own desires. It is nothing except a revelation that has been revealed. So these references in the Quran make it absolutely clear that the Sunnah, the example of the Prophet Muhammad is an intrinsic part of understanding the religion of Islam. Now let's look at some of the ways in which the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad has been preserved. First of all, the Sunnah or the example of the Prophet is a very practical thing. Let's remember this. For Muslims, the Prophet Muhammad is the best example of how to be as a human being. In fact, the Quran references that in the 33rd chapter of the Quran, in the 20th past ayah, the Quran tells us the meaning of which is, Verily, most certainly, in the Messenger of God is a most excellent example for anyone who believes in God and the last day. So the Quran is telling us that in the example, in the life, in the pattern of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, is a good example. A way to follow for anyone who believes in God in the last day. So Muslims, of course, they believe in Allah and they believe in the last day, the day of judgment, the accountability, the hellfire, the paradise. They believe in that. So therefore, they will try their best to emulate the example, the manners, the behavior of the blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Sunnah, the example of the Prophet, was applied in people's lives. It was not only memorized in the sense that I heard the Prophet say this, I saw the Prophet do that. They themselves applied it practically. For example, the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, said, if it wasn't a burden, if it wasn't going to be such a difficult thing for my nation, I would have made the use of the tooth stick, brushing the teeth, an obligation upon the Muslim nation. And the Prophet himself used to frequently use the tooth stick. He used to use it in the morning, in the evening, before he came out of the house, before he prayed. And his companions practically followed that example. And that practical example was followed by their children. And that was followed by their children. And so they would say, well, we saw the Prophet Muhammad do this, and we saw the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do this, and this is what he told us to do. So it is not, remember, it is not merely memorizing some academic thing. It's an actual practical application in one's everyday life. So this is one of the ways in which the Sunnah of the Prophet was preserved. And just in reference to this, I remember that my dad always taught me a saying, my dad, Gavin Green, he taught me a saying that his dad taught him and probably his dad taught him. And that was a little phrase he uses, R-A-U. R-A-U is an acronym for return after use, meaning when you have used something, make sure you put it back where you found it in the first place, return after use. So actually what we find is, is here is a chain of transmission. I learnt from my father, Gavin Green, who learnt from his father. So actually this chain stretches back over a hundred years. If you count my father's 86 and you count it back to his dad, that is really nearly you know, 70, 80 years. That's quite a long time. And if I inculcate my children 
with the same thing and then they narrate it to their children. This is what we call a chain of transmission. This has a special term in Islamic terminology. It's called the Isnad. And the Isnad is a very, very important thing in the preservation of the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. Because people began to invent things and they began to invent sayings about the Prophet. So some of the companions, they said, okay, we will not accept any more anyone coming along and saying, I heard the Prophet say this, I heard the Prophet said that. No, we want to know which companion of the Prophet Muhammad did you hear this from? And then they would go and check from this companion. Did you say this? Did you hear the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam say that? And if they discovered that the person was a liar and they had invented a lie, they would tell everybody. They would make it known publicly. This man lied against the Prophet. Don't believe him. He's a liar. He's a kadhab. He's a, uh, an inventor of hadith of the Prophet. And one of the most strong hadith of the Prophet that is through a mutawatir transmission. And we mentioned what mutawatir is previously. Is that whoever lies about me intentionally, let them put their seat in the hellfire. Whoever intentionally invents a lie against the Prophet, they are going to be destined to be burned in hell. It's a very, very severe thing. So nobody should go around inventing things and saying the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this and the Prophet Muhammad said that. Well, some people did start doing that, even to the extent that Aisha was commenting about this fake coins that she called the fake coins were not real fake coins, they were the hadith of the Prophet that people were inventing. So the companions, they said, no, we want to know who said it. Where did you learn it from? Give us the isnad. And this is where the chain of narrators developed. And from that, the scholars started to study. Did this person meet that person? Was he truthful? Was he honest? Did he have a good memory? Was he a pious person? They began to check the character and the personality of every single person in this chain of narrators. And they did this in order to authenticate and make sure that every person in this chain was trustworthy, that either these people in the chain had met each other and had learned this hadith from each other. And they did all of this to ensure that there was a process in place through which and by which we could determine who and what were the things that the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, what did he really say and what are the things that we have some doubts about whether he said it or not and what things that, you know, have been invented and lies attributed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, this is really a very huge and extensive subject. It's really a science. It's something that people have dedicated their whole lives to, is to studying the science of the transmission and the accurate and authentic transmission of the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. But of course, there have been scholars throughout the ages, Muslim scholars, who have dedicated their lives to this science. And they have compiled books, authentic books, like those I have already mentioned, like Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih al-Muslim and the Sunnan of Abu Dawood and the Sunnan of Nasa'i. There are anyway a number of collections of books. When I say collections, but they, they are books where the hadith of the Prophet have been collected and they have been authenticated by the scholars of the hadith. So like I say, it is a very extensive subject, but all of this is to assure us that when we say a hadith of the Prophet is authentic, it's sahih. You can be sure that it is something the Prophet Muhammad really did say or he really did do. That's it for this episode, the preservation of the hadith of the Prophet. I hope you're going to join us next time for our proof that Islam is the truth.